Good morning and welcome to a Friday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. This morning I am joined by my very dear friend, Zach Wilson. Good morning, Zach. Good morning. As we're waiting for folks to jump on, <clears throat> you know, Zach, we got to pay the bills around here. Let's talk about some of our amazing sponsors. We got sponsors like Precision Holsters Makers of the Ultra Appendix Rig, which I'm currently wearing, as well as the competition line that I use when I shoot with my friend Zach. Uh, a little IDPA action. We, they are also the makers of the tactical belt that I'm wearing. Uh, Mike Seeklander is using Precision Holsters. Mr. Rob Latham, I saw him sporting our Precision Holsters. All the cool kids are doing it. Please check out the links today at AmericanWarriorsShow.com for discount codes to Precision Holsters and all of our amazing sponsors. And another thing about Precision that makes them really cool is they're veteran owned, made here in America. They have a no questions asked, a full money back guarantee. You're going to love them. Uh, pick yourself up something there at precisionholsters.com. Also, Mountain Man Medical, that co-branded trauma kit we've been talking about. It's a project we've been working on for some time, and it is finally out. The co-branded American Warrior Society and Mountain Man Medical Trauma Kit. Of course, over there at Mountain Man Medical, you've got Brian McLaughlin, former Navy corpsman, uh, multiple tours of the Marines in Afghanistan, him and my good friend Justin Carroll, who is on his way here today, him and his lovely Brad. They're going to be spending the weekend with us. Uh, but Justin was a MARSOC operator, and we put our heads together and come up with this trauma kit, which is uh, absolutely amazing. You can pick up all the products as well as some amazing training over there at Mountain Man Medical. Check them out today. Cool Fire Trainer, man. As Zach will tell you, ammunition prices have been bananas for the last 18 months or so. So the Cool Fire Trainer can definitely be a good stand-in for dry fire training, uh, as you were for live fire training. It could take a dry fire game to the next level. The Cool Fire Trainer is your gun, your trigger, your sights. All you got to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring, and you have an amazing training tool. Check them out. APPHemp.com. I ran into my good friend Jesse Ross over there at Appalachian Standard at my buddy's retirement at Paris Island this week, Zach, and him and his family are growing some amazing CBD products in the beautiful mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. If you, and uh, talking to multiple people, they're like, man, I'm running, I'm rubbing CBD salve on my calves and my lower back. It's really helping. You can also take some of their tincture, put a couple of drops underneath your tongue before you go to bed at night. You'll definitely sleep better. Check out APP Hemp. Century Martial Arts Makers of the Bob XL. Last but not least, I'm looking at old Bob over there right now, staring at me, mean mug of me in the corner. And uh, the, the uh, Bob XL, the body opponent bag, XL, which is extra long, so you can get some good common peroneal leg strikes on old Bob or put a gi top on him and choke the crap out of him. Bob is an amazing training tool. You can also shoot him with all the 5.56 five, you want. He makes an amazing three-dimensional target. Check out all of our amazing sponsors, as I said before. At AmericanWarriorsShow.com, we have deep discount codes for everybody that watches Coffee with Rich or the American Warrior Show, which is America's number one self-defense podcast. Here in just a second, Zach, I'm going to welcome everybody to the show. But if you don't know, my name is Rich Brown, co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, which is America's number one self-defense podcast. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, and special operations officer. And but Zach, before we get into the show, let's welcome Gerald onto the show, coin number 952 out there in Oregon. David Garrett, my good friend in South Carolina. Will Parker, Semper Fi brother, out in Montana, coin number 800. And Will will be coming to do some training with Mike and I with a federal agency that will be training uh, here real soon. Look forward to seeing you again, Will. Tony is on from Brunswick, Georgia. My, my brother, Jeff Brown, <coughs> my retired maritime law enforcement officer. An all-around man of mystery. Good morning, brother. Chad Ray. This is why the backwards hat. Lincoln Hawk. Chad, stay in your lane, pal. <laughs> Chad, uh, we'll see you on the mats, brother. We, we, we uh, roll at Samuel Bragas. Come on down anytime. Hey, please like and share, guys. we got a great show coming up for you today. I'm going to give you a moment to share this. I've got my good friend Zach on. Let's read Zach's bio. For a very informal introduction to Zach, he is, number one, has an addictive personality that makes him extremely competitive with literally everything he does. I'll vouch for that. <laughs> As only, number two, has only been around since breakfast, but is highly opinionated due to him being a millennial. <clears throat> yep, I agree with that. 
Officially, Zach is currently a member of the Department of Energy working as a security police officer on a special response team. After leaving a DOE firearms instructor position for Project Enhancement Corporation, in addition that he is back on the jiu-jitsu mats after a little hiatus and currently ranked to the Gracie Baja system, training with Samuel Braga at Gracie Baja Knoxville. When he has time, he occasionally shows up to shoot IDPA. Yeah, you and me both, brother. USPSA and PRS matches. In 2015, he received his bachelor's in emergency service management and is now toying with the idea of getting a master's degree. Prior to getting hired on with the Department of Energy, Zach spent 14 years as a police officer with the Knoxville Police Department. All his years in the department were in the patrol division, along with the way he became a firearms instructor and a field training officer. Half of his time at the department was spent on their special operations squad, i.e. SWAT, as a law enforcement sniper. He was also able to attend several law enforcement courses and tactics, deadly force and law enforcement sniping. Cur concurrently to his time at KPD, Zach was also a Marine Corps with 324 Lima Company, as was I back in the day. He started out there as a regular rifleman in the infantry, but was selected to be on the scout sniper platoon after a battalion in doc in 2009 prior to deployment to Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom. He lived the life of a pig, which for those that aren't in the know is professionally instructed gunman during his deployment. And upon return to the States in 2010, he graduated from scout sniper basic course, class one TAC 10 at Quantico, Virginia. His time in the Marine Corps ended in 2012, and during his tenure, he was able to attend several military schools and courses. From 2012 to the present, he's also a sniper cadre member of the <clears throat> excuse me, Indiana Law Enforcement Academy, where they instruct and perform federal accredited basic and advanced law enforcement sniper, sniper courses every year. And speaking of Indiana, he also joined the Indiana National Guard in 2019 as a scout sniper section leader. Good morning, Zach, and welcome to the show, brother. More rich. Thanks for having me. Yeah, guys, please like and hit that share button. Zach says he's promises he's going to ruffle, ruffle some feathers this morning, so I can't wait. Nah, I'm just going to tell the truth, man. There we go. Zach, what does your bio overlook, brother? Well, mm, I don't know. If you're asking uh, why I chose the Marine Corps, I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, one of my favorite Bible verses is uh, Proverbs 16, 9. Uh, you know, a man's heart advises his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody's got their own personality. Everybody is the individual that they're going to be. Uh, you know, me, just I don't know why I was born the way I was. Uh, I was just trying to figure out my life, you know, and the whole time God is kind of orchestrating, you know, closing and opening doors and, for some reason, uh, I don't know, T to me, something stuck out about the Marine Corps uh, compared to all the other branches. You know, uh, I, I think about this all the time. You know, the, the younger I was, uh, you know, we're all I guess we all go through that phase of being bulletproof. But, uh, you know, the older I get, the more I realize it doesn't matter what branch you're in. Uh, it doesn't matter what your MOS was. It, the fact that you served is all that matters in my opinion you know uh, be proud of it uh whatever you did whatever branch you served in just be proud you know that's uh that's you that's who you are own it you know um for me the law enforcement thing I, I always wanted to be in martial arts when i was a kid i'd argue with my parents all the time uh you know hey i want to do this i want to train with this i finally started doing taekwondo uh, when I was around 13, 14. And uh, the school that I went to, that's what kind of started my life journey. Uh, my lead instructor, he worked for the Knoxville Police Department. He uh, was on their SWAT team. And uh, he had a, he was also a prior Marine. So, you know, I'm showing up to Taekwondo, uh, getting the brake speed off of me, basically. And uh, I, he was kind of a mentor, kind of a father figure. And, uh, you know, I was like, Hey, uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, as I got older, you know, my parents, they're like, Hey, when you turn 18, get out or get a job. And, uh, I didn't really know what to do. I turned 18. Uh, my Taekwondo instructor was like, Hey, there's a cadet program at the Knoxville police department, apply for it. I'll help you. You know, I'll, you, you can use me as a reference apply for it. Uh, 
if you like it, uh, when you turn 21, they'll put you in the police academy. Uh, if not, you know, hey, they pay for college. You get paid as decent money for a teenager. I mean, just fill it out. So I went through that process. I applied. Uh, it took me six months to get hired on. Uh, that whole time I was still soul searching though. And I had a lot of pull to do the Marine Corps thing. And uh, especially the cadet life, it was basically a meter made and I was miserable, you know, and uh, I, I kept asking questions, you know, Hey, cause I was interested in tactics, you know, I, I love learning stuff. And I, I felt like the, the atmosphere of the police department was, well, you got to pay your dues. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll pay my dues. Uh, let's start right now. They're like, well, you're, you know, you're a kid. And I'm like, doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I, so I, I don't like being told no. And that combined with uh, some of my friends and influences I had in my life, I just felt like the Marine Corps was the right way to go, you know? Uh, and people ask me all the time, why did you pick that branch? I don't know. Uh, something just, there was just something to me personally, there was something different about that branch compared to the others. And that's what called me. That's where, uh, that's what I went. And Hey, I just, my plan was, uh, I'll join 324 out of Johnson city. I'll fill both of them out. And, you know, if I lean more towards law enforcement, uh, I'll get out of the Marine Corps. If I lean more towards the Marine Corps, then I'll switch and, uh, leave law enforcement and go active, you know? So that was my game plan. Cool. So I, I didn't realize you were in the cadet program back in the day. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. Well, that makes sense. I had a similar experience with joining the Marine Corps. My boss, uh, when I graduated high school, actually right before I graduated, was a former Marine man. And the guy was an absolute stud. I'm sure he still is today. But, uh, he, you know, he worked out, he, washboard abs you know he wasn't afraid of punching somebody in the face and did so many times as my manager <laughs> and every, every girl you know uh, it seemed like he was dating about 20 different women at the time i mean he was just an absolute animal and uh so you know i remember one time like dude where do they make people like you it's like hey man everything you see i learned in the marine corps i'm like right on <laughs> but yeah he was a, he was a stud and uh so law enforcement you always had a compulsion to serve it sounds like and this is just a natural extension of that. So let me ask you this though, brother, how'd you get into BJJ? Cause I think you have a Taekwondo black belt, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I got my kooky wand from Seoul, Korea. Uh, when I was 17, I went to the junior Olympics, uh, got silver in my division. Um, uh, I, I mean, <sighs> life happened, man. You know, that's basically, uh, what the, hiccup was with taekwondo uh you know I, I went from being a 17 year old stud to when i turned 18 they put me in the adult division and uh you know when you're when you're a young 18 year old kid trying to figure out life uh trying to work a job trying to train versus you have a 23 year old bum that doesn't do anything but train eight hours a day seven days a week you're gonna have problems when you step in the ring with them you know and uh that me getting bumped up to the adult division, especially at a national level. Uh, Cause I mean, I was trying to be competitive. Yeah, I, I had in my mind, my goal was to be on the Olympic Taekwondo team, but man, there were some monsters and I just could not put the time in on the mats to train, to be competitive. I, I couldn't, you know, uh, with the job I had at the police department, you know, and with the Marine Corps thing. And on top of that, my school that I was training at, I was, Besides my, oh, sorry. Besides my instructor, I was the oldest guy there. I, everybody else was a couple of years younger than me. So it focused more on like adolescent, you know, youths and stuff. So it was hard to find training partners to even, it, even if I did have the time, it was hard to find training partners that could push me. And uh, I, I just kind of fell out of it. You know, uh, I didn't really train for a couple of years. And then right when I was, I started jujitsu when I was, getting ready to turn 21. Uh, and Cody Hudson, a mutual friend of ours, he, uh, I heard him talking about it and, uh, I, I don't know, it just kind of stuck out to me. Uh, I used to wrestle a little bit in high school and I was like, you know, I had a good time. Uh, I went into a jiu-jitsu class, figured I'd try it and, uh, I got destroyed. But, uh, 
I, I don't there's something about it kind of stuck with me. I was like, man, I, I just I want to be good at that. So I, I kept showing up and now it's a very intricate part of my life. So yeah, you're a you're a dangerous purple belt, I'll tell you that, man. Dangerous. Nah. Let's welcome some folks onto the show, man. Dave Brothers is on. Lieutenant Colonel Brothers, good morning, sir. Coin number 1997. Uh, Robert Bird is on. Good morning. Our good friend Dave Frazier's on. Good morning, brother. Will Rhodes is on out there in Missouri. Walt Davis, good morning, sir. Happy late birthday. Ruben is on. He said, is Rich Brown's middle name produce because he's looking fresh? <laughs> Absolutely, it is. Nancy is on. Dave Frazier says, absolute beast on the mats. I'll, I'll account for that. Uh, so, yeah, so you joined, uh, you, you picked up your blue belt and you took a hiatus for some time. And uh, you've been back now for what, Zach, about a year and a half, two years now? Uh, over two years now. Over two years, yeah. So uh, let me ask you this, man. This is going to be kind of a pointed question. You know, we talked about military and law enforcement. Would you recommend that career path for someone today in 2021? I mean, it, you know, if it's calling to you, yeah, uh, I'm not going to discourage anybody from doing what they feel like they need to do in their life, you know, uh, and the, you know, the Marine thing in some ways, uh, I'm out in some ways I still am a Marine, you know, it's, uh, I hate to be cliche about it, but I don't know. Uh, I guess it is a lifestyle, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So uh, what about for yourself? You think you would do it again? Uh, well, definitely. Uh, the In the law enforcement thing, you know, it, I'm going to flip the question around on you. It's not really uh, would I be a law enforcement officer in this climate? It's would this climate allow me to be a law enforcement <laughs> officer? I, I think that's a better question. But uh, okay. I, uh, I've never had an issue with the job. You know, uh, the job was always awesome. Uh, I know that I don't work at the Knoxville Police Department any longer, but, uh, you know, my wife and I prayed about the decisions that we made and I'm, I feel like I am where I'm supposed to be right now. But other than that, uh, I never had an issue with the job as being a law enforcement officer. Uh, it's a great job. You know, you just, uh, y you have to know what society you're in. You have to know the culture, the environment. Uh, it's very political right now. Uh, just if, if you do want to be a law enforcement officer, I guess the advice I'd give is make sure you're vetting the department you're going to work at, the agency you're going to work for. Make sure that you agree with the same morals and ethics and values of the command staff that you're going to work for, because ultimately uh, they are going to decide your fate should something arise in the news and they decide, as, you know, the news wants to, I guess, plaster you as the bad guy so what piece of advice would you give someone uh, going into law enforcement today besides the look into morals and ethics of the command staff which is obviously kind of hard to do from the outside looking yeah. in you know I, and so when i had new guys in the car with me uh training new people i think the biggest misconception people have uh is cops and also on the civilian side um our job, we've kind of gotten away from this. Our job as officers is not to write citations. It's not to arrest people. Our job is to be a problem solver. And I, I feel like we've gotten away from that philosophy. Um, you know, like arrest citations, arrests, you know, all these things, they are tools to an end. Uh, they shouldn't be the main focus. Uh, the focus should always be solve the problem. So if somebody come to me, they're like, hey, you know, I want to get into law enforcement. Uh, you know, I'm new to this. What do you recommend? My advice would be, hey, focus on solving the problem. Uh, plus a short term solution, plus a long term solution. If you can't, uh, if you can't reach the long term solution on the call for service you're answering, then it, at a minimum, you know, find a short term solution, and maybe maybe that'll hold out. Maybe that will transform into the long term. You know. Uh, but yeah, that, that's my biggest piece of advice. Like, what can you do to solve the problem? I, I love that, man. I have never heard anybody say it that, that way. And I want to unpack that a little bit before I do. The esteemed Dr. T.C. Fuller is on. Good morning, Dr. Fuller. Glad to have you on the show. Of course, uh, Dr. Fuller, retired FBI. Let's see. So your point about being, being a problem solver, I think this is an interesting idea because 
I hear people, uh, really educated, thoughtful people that say, well, you know, the frontal lobe for kids don't develop until they're around 30. So really your 20s, you're just an idiot, you know, bumping into walls and stuff like that. And I just I could not disagree with that more. Uh, and I know that I'm judging it by my own anecdotal experience and perhaps yours and some of the others on the show today. But, you know, I got married at 18. By the time I'm a cop at, at 27, I've literally circled the globe three times. I've been in combat. I've been to 24 different countries, carried a, uh, carried concealed firearms and weapons for my country and been to war, had two kids. And now I'm a 27 year old police officer. <clears throat> so, and, and your point about you drive up to a car crash in the middle of the road. I know you've done this thousands of times. You jump out of your car and you immediately have to start making decisions, assessing uh, who's hurt, who's injured, is somebody pinned in the car? If they're not, we need to get these cars off the roadway. We need to open up lanes of travel. You're, you're telling people what to do. Get your insurance out, move your car over there. Are you okay? Is she all right? Who saw it? Who shot John? The whole nine yards. And you're making decisions very rapidly that most attorneys would agonize over for weeks on, hmm, would it be appropriate for him to say that? And let's look at case law. You're not looking at crap. You're making decisions. What? And, and again, like you said, Zach, these aren't maybe good long-term decisions, but I've got to make rapid fire decisions right now. That's in the best interest of not just them, but the community and everyone involved. Did you agree in that? Yes, I do agree in that. And the, if you make an arrest as a law enforcement officer, you want it to be a legitimate arrest. Uh, but I mean, I, I'd be lying to you if I told you that, uh, you know, every arrest I've had in my career was a success in court, uh, you know, but you, again, that goes back to was the problem solved? Uh, a prime example, you know, there was a, there was an issue where uh, a couple of years ago, I got into it with a, a juvenile and this juvenile ended up being arrested. We go to juvenile court and uh, they had a valid argument about the kids upbringing and all, you know, whatever. But the judge was asking, uh, officer, what do you want to do? I was like, sir, it's whatever you recommend. And he's like, well, because uh, he was going to go to some type of probation uh, option. I was like, I'm fine with that. And he thought I was going to be argumentative. I was like, no, your honor, uh, it's whatever you recommend. And I told the judge, I was like, your honor, the problem at the time was that kid needed to be removed from the environment that he was in. That was why he was arrested. He wasn't arrested because I thought the arrest was going to fix his personality. I, I'm not naive enough to believe that. He needed to be removed from that situation. And the arrest was the only option to remove him from that situation. So that arrest solved the problem. My goal wasn't to get him convicted on anything. You know, I wanted to solve the problem. So if you have a solution to his behavioral issues, I'm good with that. I have no, you know, I'm not trying to stick it to the kid, but the judge was like blown back. He, he'd never heard an officer. And I, I don't understand where this mindset has gone because uh, when I was a new officer, the FTOs that I had that mentored me, they'd be, they send to me all the time. Hey, we're problem solvers. Hey, we're problem solvers. So, I mean, my entire career, I've always tried to focus on, Hey, what's, if I get called anywhere, Okay, what's the problem? Why am I here? Why did somebody feel like they need to call the police? And what's the solution to this to appease all sides of the problem? So, now that's that's a well said. You know, I worked a case where uh, this scumbag bit his, and this is also this is an interesting story because it talks about the fallibility of memory as well. So, in my memory, he bit off her thumb, but I actually. Uh, going through the attic recently and I come across the arrest reports and I saw, cause it was like one of the last arrests I made as a cop before I went back in the Marine Corps, he'd actually bit off her index finger, but I can swear to you, Zach, I can remember the, the thumb dangling, but I'm completely wrong. I mean, obviously the, the incident report would be accurate more so than my memory after 20 something years. But anyway, he had, he had a long list. I mean, 17 felonies, some obscene amount, you know, this is, uh, his girlfriend and he gets home and the literally the water's not boiling fast enough to cook him his chicken pot pie or whatever. So he takes the boiling water off the stove and starts beating her with a pan and choking her. And, uh, she puts her hands up in his face to try to get him off. And, and he just bites down and bites the finger off. 
So I get a call as a Marine staff sergeant that because the trial is finally going to trial and they're like, Hey, you know, did you, were you used to be officer Brown? Yeah. You're the arresting officer. What do you think about if the court sets this aside, if as long as he goes to anger management and he's going to talk at men's groups and stuff like that, I'm like, if you're asking for my opinion, no, the dude needs to be under the jail. You know, no, I don't agree with that. <clears throat> well, that's really what we want to do. I'm like, if the state wants to do that, that's fine. Don't ask for my opinion because the guy would never, we'd have to pump in sunlight to this clown until he drops dead, you know, yeah. because I think a society at some point, I'd say 17 felonies is enough. You're, you've broken your societal contract so many times, man. You're just a, you don't need to be uh, around normal people. What do you think? I mean, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, obviously there's different levels of offenses. Uh, you know, I mean, sometimes the issues are just so deeply woven in somebody's soul. I mean, it's just, man, I don't know if there's a, ever going to be a turnaround point for that person. It's, you know, I mean, look at, look at pedophilia and stuff like that. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I feel like I can't really, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's one of those things, man. It, 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 you have to judge people individually and there's some interesting stuff out there where they've got AI, you know, artificial intelligence that's looking back on 40 years of court records in New York city because they keep records on all this and the judge judges that would set bail <clears throat> based on this person that's standing. So the judge is actually looking at the person, looking at their, attorney and he's looking at their list of charges past and current and he's making a bond decision and they had computers do the same thing where it never gets to see the person it just looks at the facts and the computers make better decisions than, than a judge would because a lot of times a judge goes ah you know i'm gonna take it i'm gonna take a chance on on old rich brown and i'm gonna let him back out on the street on a five thousand dollar bail and of course he gets out and kills someone two days later where the AI would have said, no, revoke bail on this guy. And uh, so some of it is, you know, beyond psychology. Yeah. Well, I will, I will say this, you know, some of the uh, revolving door issues that happen at the DA's office and the court systems, the judiciary branch, I think that in some ways that has led to the detriment of our society and that's why we're dealing with the issues that we're dealing with right now, because in some ways uh, they've, so I've been reading this uh, really awesome book. I think I've talked to you earlier about it, but, it, uh, you know, when in the insurgent war, but it talks a lot in that book about uh, criminality and stuff. But I, one of the biggest takeaways I have from reading that book, and it's an awesome book, but uh, you know, impunity and it, impunity is what drives insurgency. Impunity is what drives criminality. And in some ways, with this revolving door concept, giving everybody a pass, uh, we have inadvertently, as a nation, kind of given a little bit of impunity to these criminals. And when, we, when we've done that, it's kind of sparked more aggression, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody, it seems like people in my family, my close friends, uh, talk a lot about how crime is on the rise, violence is on the rise. I think that has a lot to do with the judiciary system, you know. Uh, oh, that's that's spot on, man. Could you want to unpack unpack that impunity a little bit more, please? Uh, in what way? So you're talking about they're they're just you go to court and you get a slap on the wrist and you go ahead. Yeah, and I mean, oh, okay. basically, uh, you know, I mean, if there there's got to be. Uh, accountability, you know, uh, I, I know that it's a case by case basis. Uh, you know, I don't want anybody, any of your listeners to think that I'm advocating, you know, to go out here and just, uh, if you stole something, chop off your hand instantly without a, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, I mean, I, you have to enforce discipline. Uh, there has to be respect for the laws. There has to be a rule of law. Uh, there's gotta be a government, you know, and if the government lets a, section, a gang, uh, whatever you want to use to describe, whatever adjective you want to throw in there uh, to describe a group, you know, if they give them the ability to grant impunity, 
then, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be a rise in crime. Uh, it kind of goes back to the broken window theory uh, that I learned in the police academy. You know, uh, you see a broken window, you know, it kind of grows. Uh, they don't want to, nobody fixes it. You know, people start coming around. They're like, oh, you know, hey, I'll, I'll break out more glass. You know, uh, do I need to keep reiterating or? No, no, okay. I think I think most people watching or listening to the show are current or former law enforcement military okay. folks. They get it. Yeah. But but the, the the you're right. I told my wife yesterday, you know, we just got came back, like I said, from the retirement in Beaufort, and there was a, a guy driving a car, weaving and acting like a, a asshole in front of us. And I remember telling Lisa, I'm like, man, you know what? People that say prison doesn't deter crime, it's deterring me right now. Because if I knew there was, I could act with impunity, this this kind of behavior on the highway would not be tolerated. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Um, and to your point about accountability, you know, I'm going to throw the the General Milley thing out there. You know, Ger General Milley, for those that have been under sleeping under a rock recently, he's the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and during uh, Trump's f uh, final days in office, he called his counterpart in China, allegedly, in the new book coming out by Bob Woodward and, and Robert Costa uh, called Peril. He is alleged to have called his his counterpart in the Chinese government and said, look, if I'm paraphrasing, if we attack, I'm going to call you first. OK, you're going to call. I'm going to call you. Now, here's what here's the problem I have with that. Everybody thinks of a cruise missile strike and that, oh, uh, General Milley is going to call and say, hey, you need to get those people out of that building. We're going to smack it with a, a cruise missile. But let's say we were doing an amphibious invasion and you've got a division of Marines uh, coming ashore and this scumbag General Milley, I'll go on record as, as saying that is going to call his counterpart in the Chinese uh, allegedly alleged scumbag is going to call his counterpart in the Chinese military and say, Hey, First Marine Division's hitting your shore tomorrow at 0730, H hour. And nobody says that, it's a, you know, why is this guy still in office? I have no idea. I'm going to spend a good portion of my day today writing letters that uh, to every elected official up and down that this guy's got to go because that is unacceptable. That is a job for the State Department there, General Milley. You do your job and uh, let the State Department do theirs. I have a complete problem with that your, your any thoughts on that i i honestly i sometimes i feel like i'm watching a sitcom with this stuff i mean it's it's unreal uh i hear and read some of the articles about this guy and i'm like is this really happening you know i mean it's it's surreal uh i don't understand how this is not treason <laughs> yeah that's my own personal opinion I know I'm not the end all be all of anything, but I uh, I don't understand how this isn't perceived as treason. I mean, if I get that we have to, uh, you know, try to keep somewhat of a political relationship with every nation. Uh, I understand that, you know, uh, as far as trade and stuff. But it, if President Biden did not say, hey, can you speak? To the Chinese government on my behalf, I mean, I don't understand how that's not a breach of the chain of command either. Uh, I mean, this guy just reaching out, you know, to the Chinese general. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And I get it. You want to keep open lines of communication and, and that's fine. But to be as specific as to say, I'm going to let you know, bro, let's take this down to the micro level because you're you're currently a scout sniper with uh, the Indiana National Guard. Let's say you guys get deployed. And you're like, hey, hey, look, bro, I've got my cell phone on me. Before I take a shot, I'm going to call you guys and let you know if the command is given orders, okay? If the command orders me to, to take out the, the key military leader in your organization, bro, I'm going to give you a call. And I'm going to tell you before we do it. They would, you, you would be spending the rest of your natural life in Leavenworth. Am I right or wrong on that? No, you're right. You're so right. why is this any different? Why is it any different? I don't know. Uh, politics are at play. Uh, things that are above my pay level are at play. You know, uh, I will say this because, you know, I was talking to some of my buddies about this at work because this is a pretty 
uh, the General Milley stuff is a hot topic at work, obviously. But, you know, uh, with our security clearance level for the job that we have now, I mean, if you leave a computer unattended without signing out, I mean, it could potentially be an incident of security concern. And you have a guy that I'm assuming General Milley has higher clearance levels than I am, than I have, you know, as far as the access he's allowed. And you have this guy calling a foreign nation speaking to their military. I mean, it's it's laughable that how nobody is doing anything about this. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. Uh, I, I could talk a lot about China. Uh, you know, th- it, this is something else that hasn't been said. Uh, I don't know why we are not acknowledging that we're in a second Cold War. You know, uh, the first Cold War with Russia, I mean, it was an arms race, right? And I'm not saying that we're in an arms race with China, but we're definitely, we are 100% in an ec- economical war with China. I mean, they're trying to beat us out economically. And I don't know why people aren't acknowledging that. Uh, I mean, this is, lit- in my opinion, this is little, literally the second Cold War. And uh, I mean, we're just kind of like focusing on all this stuff internally, you know, going on in America. And I, I no, I don't disagree with that at all. Of course, Dr. Fuller says, uh, oh, come on. What's it? What good is a double standard if you don't enforce it? Yeah. yeah and that's, uh, that's exactly right. And I, I have a problem with that. You know, there should be, you know, everyone should be equal under the law. Not all men are created equal. Okay. They're, I'm never going to be LeBron James. Okay. LeBron James is an incredible athlete. I am not, you know, so not all men are created equal. My jujitsu is not as good as, Everybody else, it's, it's not as good as yours, never will be. But we should be equal under the law of the United States. And to your point, you know, I remember one time I was at a conference when I was a chief warrant officer in the Marine Corps, and I, I hold a major's billet, and I we're at a conference that I've put on, and I go to, to tube up my computer. I put my common access card in it and type in my password, and it says, you've been locked out. You need to contact your administrator. I'm like, why the hell am I locked out? So they're like, oh, you know, they were doing some scanning of the computer, man. They found something on it, brother. I can't say anything. There's an investigation coming from, from Washington, D.C., man. The, the heads are going to roll. I'm like, oh, my God, what, what have they found? And, and what, what had happened was, it's a long story, but I, when they said that we could no longer plug in uh, USBs into the computer anymore because some state actor left a USB somewhere at the Pentagon, plugged it in, and a virus took over. So now nobody in the Department of Defense can plug in the USB to any computer. So they thought that Rich Brown had plugged in a USB at some point. And, and what had happened was because I was in command of the, of the jump command post, if, if a hurricane came, you know, I had to have the ability to take everything with me. We couldn't wait on the servers to come weeks later. I had said, hey, uh, put me something inside the computer that has a giant hard drive in it. And the way that the computer techs had done it, made the people think that it was that but my point of saying all that it's just a lot of technical mumbo jumbo the point being that my head was laying down on the chopping block and and here come the investigation until they got it sorted out and how general milley still has a job and that joe biden can say i have confidence in him is beyond me uh skip says remember the navy crewman that took six pictures of a nuclear sub he worked on he was a kid proud of his job I do understand it was wrong, but his sentence was over the top. Yeah. <clears throat> Dave says, uh, CJC says we aren't in conflict with PRC, just like Athens was at peace with Sparta. Yeah. Good point. Did you tell them that Rich Brown could not even spell USB? <laughs> oh, Dr. Fuller. Good to have you on, sir. Let's, let's shift gears a little bit. I'm sure we'll come back to this at some point. I want to talk about instructorship because... I know that you have taught uh, urban sniping to other law enforcement agencies. You actually invited me out to attend some of uh, the training that you were conducting. It was absolutely phenomenal. I really enjoyed that. What In your, your time of being an instructor, mentor, teacher, trainer, what makes a great instructor? Uh, I've, you know, I've been asked that a lot. I still don't know if I 100% know the answer to that. Uh, if I could 
think of like maybe a word to describe the qualities, I would say passion, you know, uh, being passionate about what you're doing. Uh, you know, and jujitsu, I'm not trying to go off on a tangent here, but uh, that's one of the reasons I love jujitsu so much. I have learned so much about life in general by training jujitsu, you know, and uh, my reference going back to being an instructor, uh, you're never really at the end. You know, I, when I was younger and I first started instructing uh, in my mind, I felt like you just, if you had to know the material inside and out verbatim, what the book said, uh, you know, this is what you need to do. This is, and I had such a structured cookie cutter uh, compartmentalized mindset on how to approach the subjects that I was instructing. But the older I got, the more I realized, you know, you never really stop learning. Uh, being an instructor, if you going back to where I'm at now, currently, uh, I guess in my life, if somebody was to ask me, hey, uh, what would you say about being an instructor now? I would say that it's being a lifelong learner, being a lifelong student, basically. Uh, I mean, it, you're, you're just mentoring somebody. You know, you don't have to have all the answers. Uh, you don't have to have something memorized. You should be passionate about what it is you're instructing. You know, uh, it should be a calling to you. And all you're, all you're doing is helping people along the way. Uh, you know, experience, all experiences is failures. That's it. And uh, you're just sharing your experience, your failures, to make sure those people that you're mentoring don't make the same mistakes. I think it's passion. And also, uh, I'll use you as an example because, uh, you know, I've seen you teach a little bit. Of, you know, when you and I are, are rolling or training together, you know, you're, you're very patient. Uh, and I think that's another hallmark of what makes you a great instructor, your passion and your patience, because you can get frustrated with a new student as they're trying to learn a new technique or, or something. And, and a, a, a bad instructor will really not have the tolerance for that, that new student's learning. Would you agree with that? Yes. And, you know, I've even had to check myself on this, man. Uh, you know, I'm not going to come on here and put on a facade for you or your audience. I'm by no means perfect or the end all be all of anything. Uh, you know, I've made my fair share of mistakes. Uh, you know, it's hard for us to swallow that pride pill sometimes, uh, especially as instructors, you know, in the, in the fields that we work in, uh, you know, the, the personalities we are that are attracted to these career paths. Uh, you know, especially if you're an instructor, it's kind of hard to swallow that pill sometimes like maybe I don't know the answer. You know, uh, it what took me a couple of years to realize and accept was, uh, you know, I, maybe I do have the passion. I'm Maybe I'm passionate about a subject. Maybe I do have everything memorized, but maybe the way I'm stating it uh, just isn't translating to the student. And they need to hear it from a different person because that person's going to articulate it in a different way that helps them understand. And, you know, it, it took me a while to understand that it's not that I'm doing something wrong. It's just, they just need a different perspective vantage point, you know? So I, it's a, uh, it's, everything is a, some, it, everything is a process as far as learning, you know, uh, you never stop learning how to be an instructor. You never stop being a student at whatever craft you're doing. It's always a progression. So, well, speaking of that progression, you know, thinking about maybe a young uh, Zach or or maybe uh, someone watching today that wants to be a, an instructor, whether that's a martial arts combatives or jiu-jitsu instructor, firearms instructor, what advice would you give to them, Zach? Put yourself out there to fail. Uh, the So the bad instructors that I have been uh, around or have experienced in my life, uh, and I, I hate the whole, I hate that saying where they're like, people can't do teach. I hate that. I hate that you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, for the most, for the most part, that is the case, but it shouldn't be, you know, and it, it, it goes back to the ego thing. We got to drop our egos and it jujitsu is the same way. If you have an ego in jujitsu, you're never going to get better because the only way to learn is to make mistakes. You know, you have to make mistakes to learn. You don't show up on the mats and instantly become a black belt. You have to get tapped. You have to make your mistakes. You have to play your game. You have to play with things to see what works. 
and there's going to be different reactions depending on how the person reacts to you, right? Well, guess what? Life's the exact same way. Uh, you, I, if somebody wants to be an instructor, be like, look, whatever craft you want to instruct, go out there and do it. Try competitions. Try a career path. Talk to different people. Uh, nobody's an island. You know, you have to surround yourself by the tribe that you want to be included in. And, you know, you, you need to get different vantage points. You need to get different perspectives, opinions. The more experience you have, i.e. failures, the better you're going to be. So. Yeah, I love that. And I'll just give my own little anecdote on that. You know, when I retired from the Marine Corps as a chief warrant officer, I was kind of a big deal. And, uh, I uh, you know, had a lot of successes in my you know earlier in life, and here I am retiring uh, in my early 40s, and I picked up jujitsu, and I'm starting off strapping that brand new white belt on and mopping the mats at night just like everybody else. And I tell you, it was a humbling experience to get tapped out by these young guys, because I'm like, you know, you can look at your resume and and puff your chest up and go, you know, I look at your I love me wall and and think about your glory days, but it doesn't mean crap. What can you do right now? I'm not impressed with what you could do in the nineties back when me and TZ Fuller were really cool. What can you do today? If, if performance on demand was a realistic expectation of your students, and I think it is, they should demand that their instructor can perform that task. What can you do today? And that's, that's what's important. And you're going to have to fail at it, man. Um, you're going to get tapped. I'm going to, I got a private lesson coming up at three 30 today and I'm going to get smoked by my, by my instructor. I can promise you that, but I'm going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. Agree. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Will says just because someone can, can do it doesn't mean they understand how they do it. Therefore probably cannot teach it. That's a great point. Yes. And, and and that's what's that's what separates the good instructor from the, the mediocre one, right? Yes, I agree with that. And uh I you know, I'm glad he made that comment. Uh I forgot to mention that. I, I was even thinking about that, but kind of you know, anyway, but uh you, just because somebody's good at something doesn't automatically mean they're gonna be a great instructor. Uh but what I have learned is if you can break things down, uh usually this this is sorry, I'm my mind's racing hundred miles an hour. I got a lot to say about this. So guys that really excel in whatever sport or craft they're in, there's two types. There's guys that go out and zone out and they have had good mentorship to where they've been trained so well, right? That it's, it's muscle memory and they subconsciously go through all of these actions that makes them excel or succeed. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one version. The guy that, goes into autopilot and he's been trained so well, boom, I win. There's also another guy that goes out there and his mind is calm. He can make decisions. He's calm. He's smooth. And he can calculate in real time what is happening, process that information and make decisions consciously. I know that this is debatable. This is just my opinion, but yeah. he can consciously make decisions in real time that lead to excess or success and excel. Right. Mm -hmm. So the guy that subconsciously does stuff, he's not going to be a great instructor because if you think about it, he's not really breaking anything down. He's making the right actions. He's making the right movements. He's making the right decisions. Right. But he doesn't understand why he's doing what he's doing. The good instructor that consciously makes these decisions that takes the time that breaks it down mentally, like just like a jujitsu guy, you know, you, you have jujitsu guys that go out they squirrel around and they win. They're like, yeah, I tapped the guy. Up. What'd you do? I can't remember. And then you have the other guys that are like, well, this was my strategy. I went into step one. I knew he was going to react with this. So I went into step two. I knew he's going to react with this. So I went into step three and finished. Mm -hmm. Those are the guys that are going to be great instructors because they broke everything down. They're consciously making decisions in real time and they understand why it is they're making the steps and decisions that they're making. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I've, you know, we've had uh, Dusty Solomon on here before, who's done a lot of the neuroscience and written several books about it, uh, building shooters, mentoring shooters, et cetera. Phenomenal book. So 
But this is just our own anecdotal experiment experience that we're talking about here today, not, not the neuroscience behind it. But I would tell you this. Next time you're tying your shoes, just watch your hands tie your shoes. They're just making movement, and, and you have no idea. You're not thinking about do this, do that. It's just you've tied your shoes so many times, it's operating at a subconscious level. I'm telling you, just, you'll be mesmerized watching yourself tie your own shoes because there's no conscious thought. And I, and I see that from, there's a, there's a tier one guy. He's a member of, a former member, retired member of um, CAG, the special mission unit out of Fort Bragg that shall remain nameless. Anyway, he's, he is given a, a period of instruction on the rifle transition, transition to the handgun. And it is some of the worst instruction I have ever seen, period. <laughs> and we're talking about a guy who's probably killed more people than polio running ops in Iraq for a decade. I mean, a phenomenal shooter. There's no question about this man's tactical acumen, but he doesn't know how he was doing it. And it's obvious because he cannot relay the information in a way that a, an adult learner can learn. So just to hammer that nail one more time, just because you can do does not mean you can teach. I think it's a special skill and um, that not everybody has. Let's let's take let's take the next question here. Uh, tell me about your journey toward becoming a scout sniper, Zach. Uh, well, I can't talk about that without talking about God. You know, uh, man, I just you know I felt led to do it. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. I just I didn't. I had my reservations about it. Uh, I was nervous about it, but I just felt like that was. Uh, what I was being called to do and I threw my name in the hat and you know the rest is history I guess uh the battalion so we had activated we're getting ready to deploy to Iraq the battalion uh announced hey we're gonna have indoc I kind of looked around and uh I wasn't comfortable in the line company I was in you know I just be, I had a vision when I joined the Marine Corps you know I I, I had an expectation and I felt like just the normal line company did not meet at that expectation that I had, you know, and uh, I was looking for something more. Uh, I had kind of put some feelers out. Uh, I mean, recon seemed pretty cool, but just something different. I feel like the sniper, the scout sniper program was something different. You know, uh, I like being pushed. I like being challenged. Uh, it's one of those things you can't just show up, you know, uh, just because you show up and don't quit doesn't mean you're going to be a Scott Stopper. Uh, there's performance standards you have to meet. And I think that's what really interests me. It, you know, you can't, you can't just show up and be tough. You have to be smart too. And I, I wanted to be that guy, man. Uh, I went into the NDOC, I uh, got picked from the NDOC and uh, you know, my platoon mentored me. Uh, they sent me to pre sniper at Pendleton uh, that was rough. They, uh, uh I mean, what was rough pre, about it? Uh, well, so any kind of pre course, so I didn't know this, but I, you know, going back over, uh, kind of research and stuff, even in the moment, uh, it's kind of cool to learn about this. So, cause it, the whole pre sniper thing, I never even heard of that until I got put in it. So I started looking it up. And so, uh, during that window when, uh, all that was, you know, going around in my life. So the Marine Corps devised these pre-courses because of the high attrition rates at these schools, you know, so you have a uh, pre-dive for the dive course, uh, you know, pre-BRC, pre-sniper, pre you know, all these pre-courses. And the goal of the pre-courses was to uh, mitigate attrition when you actually attended the course, right? So uh, the Marine Corps is like, hey, statistically, guys, that attend pre-courses have a 95% chance of graduating on the first attempt when they actually show up to the course. So these pre-courses were like the actual courses uh, on steroids, you know? Yeah. So, um, but I mean, basically, you know, with the mentorship my platoon gave me that the pre-course gave me, when we got back to Iraq, uh, you know, doing the missions over there, we get back and they stay at school and it set me up for success to pass. So. 
Okay, so you go to the pre-course. Uh, Ned, you went to the pre-course, then you went to Iraq? Yeah, uh, during the, the buildup for our deployment, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Uh, shoot, I hope he's not watching. Uh, but basically, our gunny, it, the pre-course was an accident. It's not like they're like, oh, you know, I want Zach to be awesome, so I'm going to send him to pre-sniper. Uh, my gunny basically wanted to go to Las Vegas and vacation. So he's like, there we go. let's see, who are the guys that haven't been to sniper school yet? Okay, I'm going to put them in the pre-course so they can babysit them and they'll get good training and, you know, I can go party it up. <laughs> so that that's basically what happened. That's a but, truth for so many things in the, in, the, in the military, in the government. Yeah, oh, I know. So how was your Iraq deployment? Uh, you know... It didn't, it wasn't what I expected either. Uh, there was a lot of political tension. Uh, we were, if I'm not mistaken, we were the last combat unit in the Marine Corps to be part of OIF. So everybody was on eggshells. Don't do anything. ROEs were really tight. Uh, they didn't want anything to kick off just because we were supposed to be leaving as far as combat units, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, it, I felt like there was a lot of pressure, uh, politically on us. Uh, it, the majority of our missions, uh, we had, my platoon had like one MSIDS mission, uh, looking for an HVT. Uh, but other than that, everything else we did was like convoy security, you know, and just like, Hey, stay low profile don't be out here shaking the bushes don't kick anything off blah 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 you know and i i get it you know i they didn't want to restart the war basically you know so th it was uh yeah yeah did yeah, you find I, the did you find the hvt <laughs> no he never showed up <laughs> but you know that we uh the unit that we relieved, they gave us a file of missions that was probably two inches thick. And the opportunity was there. Just our command was not about any of any of it. So, but I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah, it is. And I tell you, there's a, every Lieutenant Colonel Battaglia commander wants to be a Colonel and they're not going to do anything. That's going to ruffle the feathers. So uh, there's very few of them out there that will actually lean forward and, and, and you know, get it on because they see the things like uh, Fred Galvin and his, you know, Fox Company Task Force Violence that went into Afghanistan and got kicked out uh, for, you know, repelling an ambush aggressively. It's, it's uh, we're, we're, I don't think we want our military leaders to act like politicians, but I would tell you that that slide has been going on for a long time. Well, I think the biggest mistake is people think that there's a separation uh, between politics and military when actually there is no separation. It's the same thing. Uh, military is just the application of force of politics. So. Yeah. The Von Clausewitz, uh, war is a continuation of politics by other means let's let's talk about this so um you do that deployment as a scout was that your only deployment as a scout sniper yes okay and uh so how about becoming a um what do you call the law enforcement snipers are they are they the same term applies that i'm gonna ruffle some feathers okay let's do uh, it. so some of the some of these guys, yes, the same term applies. Uh, I would, I would classify law enforcement as more of a marksman than a sniper, but that does not mean the potential is not there. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, I could talk about <laughs> how much time you got in your podcast because I could talk about this for probably five hours and still have some gas, but, uh, you, you know, that the reason I got into instructing was because of this issue. Uh, I have seen both sides, you know, sn sniping is sniping. Uh, the job is the same. Now the missions change, you know, obviously 
there's ROEs. We get the military's got ROEs, rules of engagement, uh, police department. They've got state laws, federal laws for deadly force. You know, uh, sometimes they're the exact same depending on the mission, you know, and it, what I hate is guys that have never been military think that law enforcement stopping should be a certain way. And I also on the flip, the flip side of that guys in the military that think law enforcement stopping should be a certain way. I've seen both sides of it and I'm telling you, it's the same job, but the, the issue is getting these other guys on board on the same page of this stuff, you know, and it, it goes back to jujitsu, man. Uh, you know, everything intertwines in this life. Uh, it's the same job. It's just there's different applications of force. And I think that's what people get so caught up on. Uh, you know, because if the classes I taught in the law enforcement community, I'm teaching the same stuff to my guys on the military side. You know, hey, guys, our job, 95 percent of our job is gathering, collecting and reporting information, mm -hmm. you know. Five to ten percent is applying force, whether it's a shot, whether it's call for fire, whatever. Uh, now, obviously, a cop isn't going to do a call for fire mission, you know. But uh, it, it's—I don't understand where the hiccup is, as far as separating what law enforcement stopping does and military stopping. Uh, you, Give me some more input, Rich, because I I don't want to go off on a tangent. Well, let's talk about this. I like the I like the fact that you said you know ninety percent or whatever I'm paraphrasing of, of your job is just collecting and gathering information, reporting information. You didn't say intelligence. You said information, and yes. the reason I oh. make that distinction is so many people misunderstand. Like my wife, she loves to. She's probably sitting at home drinking coffee, doing a puzzle right now. If I walked up and and took a puzzle piece. And said, uh, you know, what is this going to look like? I have no idea. You couldn't tell if it's going to be a sunset or a picture of a sailboat or a, a wooded glen where the deer jump into it. Because it's just a piece of information. It's only when you collect and gather those pieces of information does, does intelligence start to form. And you can go, oh, this appears to be a sunset. So I think a lot of people misunderstand that. So as a collector, gatherer, uh, and a VIP, you're not processing that information. You're just reporting it. And somebody else is up the chain is going to look at that. They're looking at the big picture. And, uh, and ultimately, you may be the tool that they decide is the right thing to, to employ that uh, precision marksmanship. Would you agree with that? Yes. And usually when I'm, in, when I'm talking to guys about understanding the difference, so we have primary and secondary vision, right? Primary vision is the raw information, the raw material that our eyes actually see, right? Secondary information is what our brains, our eyes transmit what we're uh, seeing, what we're looking at. And that information goes up to your brain and your brain processes it, right? If you don't have experience, if you don't have memory, your brain doesn't know how to process. I, I, I always use the analogy of a filing cabinet. You know, uh, if you've read books, if you have life experience, whatever, your brain's going to open up the file. You know, your eyes transmit the data. Once it gets up your brain, you know, I always envision a person walking over to a filing cabinet. They open it up and they start pulling out files, trying to see what it is that they're looking at. Right. And your brain tells you, hey, uh, this is what you're seeing. You know, so. And the reason I'm talking about primary and secondary vision is uh, it's always said snipers are the eyes and ears of the commander, right? Mm -hmm. So snipers, we're the eyes. We operate in that primary vision. That means the material that we transmit has to be unevaluated. We can't put our two cents in, our assumptions in on it, right? Once it gets moved to Intel, that's when it's going to be processed. That's when they're going to make the big picture. That's when the commander is going to have his two cents and you know, that's where all the commander's intent is going to come from. If that makes sense. So I, that's the analogy I always use. Yeah. Great, great point. I don't want your spin on it. Just give me the facts. Um, tell me that this, so you said there's really no difference between you. You've been a law enforcement sniper for years and years and years. You've been a military sniper for years and years and years. You said essentially there's really not a lot of difference. You're still the eyes and ears of the commander or the, or, the, or whatever. 
But are there any distinctions in the two? I mean, obviously, we've got rules of engagement over here, and we've got the laws of self-defense, uh, the, the law, uh, lawful use of force over here. But aside from those little slight nuances, are there any major differences? Yes. Uh, as far as resources, yes. I mean, obviously, the military, you're going to have uh, better correlation of forces, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, you know, you have QRF, you have better armored vehicle options, uh, you have CASI back options, you have call for fire options. Uh, law enforcement doesn't really have uh, those same resources, you know. Uh, I mean, we have AMRs, we have ambulances. Uh, you still got to move to the ambulance. You know, nobody's going to land an LZ for you to snatch somebody if somebody gets injured. But uh, I, I think the biggest... I guess the biggest difference goes back to uh, just the application of force, you know. Uh, and, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with impunity. Uh, you have a little bit more impunity as a military sniper than you do as a law enforcement, you know. And that that's just because, well, it makes sense. Uh, we got the Geneva Convention. We got uh, rules of engagement, all that, you know. Uh, law enforcement kind of operates under a different uh, umbrella as far as impunity because the guys that we are applying force to are American citizens. That's right. Uh, you know, the military sniper, when we apply force, it's, it's not to American citizens. Right. Uh, so I think that's the biggest difference. John has a question. He says, Rich, could you have him comment about automaticity in terms of overtraining to the point where under stress, they are trained not to fail. Have any thoughts on that? Can you say that question again? Sure. Overtraining? Yeah, could you talk about automaticit automaticity? I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. In terms of overtraining to the point where under stress, they're trained not to fail. And I, I think mean, that's that, what we're talking about. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that kind of goes back to what we're talking about. You know, you want those subconscious reactions. Uh, you know, I'm still learning about this. Uh, in some ways, I agree with that philosophy. In some ways, I don't. Uh, and the reason I say that is because of things that I've learned through jujitsu, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in some ways you do want muscle memory because you don't have time to react. Uh, and like, let's say for a self-defense situation, somebody comes up and pulls a knife on you and starts swinging. I mean, you, you need that muscle memory, right? But at the same time, uh, you know, if you get put in a stressful situation, maybe because of the distance you have to the threat or the weapon being utilized, you know, you need to be more uh, cognitive with your reaction. You need to make a conscious decision on what you should do. So I, I think it kind of goes both ways, you know, uh, there's, you have to figure out, and that's, that's what experience goes back to, you know, uh, and knowing where to fail, how you fail, where your limits are. Uh, you just kind of have to play with things in training and see, Hey, what do I need to train uh, subconsciously to react to that I need muscle memory for? Uh, also, what are the areas in my life or situations where I need to pause and think? You know, uh, that that's what I would say uh, to answer his question. I hope that's answering it uh, sufficiently. But I, I would try to identify places or situations where you need subconscious reaction and places and situations where you would need a conscious reaction and then train accordingly if that makes sense yeah it does kind of make sense and i'm a, a you know because your point about jujitsu is is interesting if you're if you and i are rolling you know i'm sure you're not thinking okay rich is coming up off of his knees i'm going to put him in spider guard i'm going to okay now he's giving me i'm going to lasso him and stuff like that it's just kind of automated to the point where you know you're you're doing it you see an opportunity subconsciously probably and you're taking it but then you have the problem with overtraining, and I'll tell you where, where I see this most often from training law enforcement officers uh, when Mike and I go out. For a long time, there was this automated response of every time I do a mag change, I'm aggressively stepping off line to do the mag change. And I think that is a problem with overtraining to the point of it's just automated because what if you're already behind cover and you're changing mags? Does that mean you're going to aggressively step out from behind cover and get shot? just because you've automated this process that, that it isn't placed into the proper context. 
And I think that is the problem. A lot of times, well-intentioned trainers will say, every time you do a mag change, I want you to aggressively step offline. Yeah, but that that is devoid of context. And I think that you have to be thinking a lot of the times. Would you? Is that kind of what you were getting at, Zach? Yes. And, uh, you know, you just brought up a great point that I didn't even think about. And as soon as you started talking about uh, your analogy, I was like, oh, it clicked with me. Uh, identifying your target. You know, if you train subconsciously to draw and shoot and you're not processing your sights, you're not processing your target. I mean, that's where blue on blue happens. Uh, yes. You know, there, there's a, a countless incidents of tactical teams, military units, law enforcement officers, uh, they get under stress and they're not paying attention. And what you being, I mean, most of your audience, law enforcement, your law enforcement, you know, we're, they're always telling you, look at the hands, look at the hands, look at the hands. You know, you see the gun, your mind doesn't process the face or the uniform and you shoot. And now before you, you look and realize, hey, I've just shot my buddy because I subconsciously pulled the trigger because I saw that gun, you know, yeah. just because that's what your subconscious is being trained to do. I could give you so many instances of this in the last several years training the law enforcement community where they were, uh, where they do exactly that. They'll do, uh, this is recognition prime decision-making you see. So when, when the target turns, you address the target. Okay, good. The target turns and the guy shoots the target and the instructor gives him his time. Good to go. And I'm like, yeah, but the target is a, it's just a guy with his hands open. He doesn't, why did you shoot, shoot that target? Well, it's recognition prime decision-making rich. I'm like, yeah, but there's no reason that that target should have gotten shot. It's the target is not just a basic IDPA USPSA target. This is a tar, an ato, anatomical target that has his hands open. It's yeah. a human silhouette with his hands open. Why did you shoot this target? Well, and it's, 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 go ahead, Zach. No, I'm I'm sorry, dude. I, I didn't mean to. I thought you were done. Well, no, no, no. I, I, I guess I am kind of done because I could go on and on and on. And I think it's a gross misunderstanding. And, it, and it's leading to, for lack of a better word, training scars that's, that's going to get somebody hurt and department suit. Go ahead. No, processing is key. And uh, I wasn't trying to interrupt you. I just, if I don't say something, I'm going to forget. <laughs> I'm forgetful. <laughs> but uh, no, just, I, I think the best way to answer uh, that gentleman's question, I forgot his name, but if, so what I'm talking about as far as identifying subconscious situations and conscious. So going back to uh, that scenario that we're just talking about. So let's say, uh, let's say I want to train for uh, engaging a target, like in a self-defense situation, right? So I want to process the target, you know, to make sure I'm correctly engaging. Is it a threat? Is it imminent? Am I checking the boxes, right? Those need to be conscious decisions that I make. The subconscious part is the draw, the draw stroke. Okay. So the subconscious needs it because I don't need to be thinking how to establish a final firing grip, the five steps of the draw stroke. None of, I don't need to be thinking about that. All that should be subconscious, right? So that would be my subconscious training, you know, the draw stroke, working all that down, breaking it down step by step, making that subconscious. Then when it happens in real life, the motion of the draw stroke is subconscious. But once my gun comes up on target, now I'm processing. I'm processing what I'm seeing. I'm using my mind to make conscious decisions. Uh, when you have drawn your firearm on suspects as a law enforcement officer, were you ever like surprised that, Oh, look, the gun is there already. Uh, sometimes yes. Sometimes no. You know, there's times where I was like, man, that was fast. I didn't plan on that happening. And there's other, there's other times where, uh, you know, that's exactly what I wanted it to happen. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it's weird, man. Uh, Lots weird. We're weird, uh, especially when you got all those chemicals running through your body, you know? Yeah. Is there, is there, this is something I, you know, I had Joe Chamlin on the show. Of course, you know, Joe, uh, he's a legend. Yeah. A legend in the, the sniper community. But when he was on the show, we talked about the civilian implications for long range marksmanship or, or what have you. What, what do you see that role? Is there a role for shots at, you know, hundred yards, 200, 300 and beyond for a civilian defender? So 
I think about this stuff a lot because I, I feel like a lot of people ask me this questions, uh, you know, and I, so before I address that, I got to go back to stopping. So distance, the distance of engagements, they do not really define the sniper. Uh, you know, I've seen law enforcement sniper shots at 10 yards. Mm-hmm. I've also seen law, law enforcement sniper shots at 400 yards. Uh, you know, in the Marine Corps, we call out to a thousand yards. Uh, there's guys that have shot past that in Afghanistan. There's guys that didn't shoot farther than 300 yards in Fallujah. I mean, it's distance is not what makes the sniper. The precision is what makes the sniper. Yeah. Uh, distance. So I, I just want to address that first, you know, because I, I think a lot of people think that, you know, they get messed up with uh, this deadly force application. The the distance is a factor when you're thinking about imminent threat, but distance doesn't really make the sniper, if that makes sense. So going back to uh, self-defense, you know, what is your, what's your threat? You know, uh, because that's what it is. Uh, it's the totality of the circumstances. What am I defending myself from? Is, do I live in a urbanized city? Uh, there's people all over the place and is somebody coming directly to me to do harm to me? You know, uh, is somebody doing harm to somebody else? Uh, do I live on the side of a mountain and there's my nearest neighbor is not even within 10 miles and there's a tactical team moving in my direction. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, you're going to have to look at the totality of the circumstances, uh, because that distance is going to be a factor when you're establishing a deadly force in your application of it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff has a good question. He says, is there a difference between military and law enforcement caliber choices? Yes, there is. Uh, there doesn't have to be, but there usually is. And it, it goes back to ammunition companies. Uh, and you, you got to think about this, uh, you know, long, while distance doesn't really define what a sniper is, uh, you have to look at the realms and the uh, battle space that you're operating in. You know, if I'm a Marine Scout sniper in Afghanistan and my AO is, goes a couple clicks out, you know, I might be engaging guys, you know, thousand plus yards, 500 plus yards, whatever. I'm, it's going to be hard to do that with a normal 308, right? I'm, I'm going to need a wind mag. And by the way, the Marine Corps did switch to wind mags as primary uh, bolt gun, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, you know, it's wind mags, 338s, blah, 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 right? Uh, law enforcement, I mean, you're going to be hard pressed to, to push out past 400 yards for your law enforcement. It depended on how you're utilized, you know? Uh, I can get into that for a second too, if you want, but. Well, I was going to uh, say what, at what range were most of your, uh, where you're sitting in a hide side observing something, what was the normal range there? So, uh, you know, and it, again, just because of how society is changing, uh, how urbanized the world is becoming, uh, it, it kind of changes the applications. And that's why I I'm adamant about there's so many, similarities between law enforcement and military sniping, uh, you know, because when I first got on the uh, SWAT team at the police department, you know, the sniper element was where guys went to, <laughs> there were usually three types of guys that were snipers on the SWAT team, old busted guys that were just trying to stay out of the way because they wanted to retire, uh, guys that were a headache to the commander and the command staff. So they didn't want to deal with them. So they put them over there or, guys that legitimately wanted to be snipers, they love the math, they love to shoot and they want to do a good job. And that's where they wanted to be. I mean, those are the three types of guys that I ran into. So, uh, but in, anyway, you know, uh, I'm not trying to get sidetracked, but, uh, I lost my train of thought. We we're talking that. about distances. So, uh, the mission kind of changed, man. You know, uh, when I was new, it was, the cookie cutter version of uh, law enforcement sniping, you know, Hey, we're getting activated for a barricaded suspect. Uh, you know, you're, you're the end of the block or across the street in the bushes, looking in the front window, looking in the back window, looking into the door, blah, blah, blah. Well, that mission kind of changed to, uh, especially with all these active shooter incidents, uh, with nine 11 happening, all this stuff, uh, 
the mission of law enforcement stoppers kind of changed. You know, uh, command staff started wanting or started to want Overwatch on special events. You know, mm -hmm. uh, hometown football games like for colleges. You know, uh, special events as far as uh, you know, you got a senior coming into town. Uh, you know, President Trump when he was making his rounds during the campaign, he came to Knoxville. You know, uh, just they want Overwatch for these positions. And uh, for the Overwatch, you know, they're putting us in skyscrapers on top of buildings on, you know. So when you start elevating and we, our arena changed from, hey, I'm across the street in the bushes to now I'm on top of a building in a very urbanized area. Uh, and I'm potentially, in theory, I mean, obviously it didn't happen because it would have been all over the news, but in theory, uh, my engagement ranges went from 30 yards to 300 plus yards. Yeah. So. What about the vehicle borne uh, urban sniping? Is that something that's getting more prevalent or, or, or not? Yeah. I hope it is. Uh, I think it needs to be having that mobile platform uh, is critical. You know, it, it's kind of like its own uh, support element because you can, you can always move. I mean, it it helps with anonymity. You know, it's hard to, especially downtown as a law enforcement officer. You know, if you're in plain clothes running around with a stopper kit, you have a chance of friendly fire from patrol if they don't know you're in the area. You have a chance of, you know, unar or armed citizens that think they're, you know, oh my gosh, this guy's going to rob somebody. You know, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. trying to do a citizen's arrest or whatever. I mean, there's there's all kinds of threats if you're not going to identify yourself as an officer because you're trying to have that anonymity in your operations, right? Uh, it's hard to move hide sites. If I'm in a building, I need to go two buildings over, three buildings over. You know, I'm not seeing what I want to see. The commander needs me to adjust fire, you know, whatever. It's, it's hard to move around just on foot, especially in a city, and still keep your uh, – anonymity right but if you're in a vehicle everything's already set up i don't have to break anything down uh my shooting position should be built in theory everything should be positioned the way it should be and in theory if i need to adjust my field of view field of fire all i have to do is have the driver just drive me wherever the commander needs me you know yeah and nobody's the wiser that's right uh, i'm not compromising anything i'm not soft compromising myself nothing so because you're in a 94 Corolla or something like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Usually with the windows tinted. I mean, everybody's got tinted windows now, you know, so. Mm -hmm. What is the most understood thing about a law enforcement sniper, Zach? The most understood? Misunderstood. Mis Sorry. Uh, I, you know, honestly, I think uh, it's what I was already talking about. Just not understanding uh, the relationship between a law enforcement sniper and a military sniper. I mean, it, there's a, uh, this is just my opinion, Rich. Uh, there's a lot of divisiveness in the community, you know? Uh, and I, I see it in my guard unit too. Uh, and I, I've been guilty of it myself. You know, we like to get in our, uh, our sections and be like, oh yeah, you know, oh, Marine Corps scout snipers, we're awesome. You know, army stoppers, we're awesome. Everybody else sucks. You know, law enforcement stoppers, we're awesome. Everybody else sucks. Instead of thinking Marine Corps stoppers, army stoppers, law enforcement stoppers, we just need to think ourselves as snipers, you know, and come together as a community, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of lessons learned from all aspects. Uh, there's great lessons law enforcement can bring to the table for military. There's great lessons military can bring to the table for law enforcement. And uh, I mean, and across the branches too. Uh, is and you know, and the more I, the more I kind of venture out and read Army pubs, read updated Marine Corps pubs, talk to guys that are snipers in the Air Force, uh, talk to some of my buddies that still do it for law enforcement agencies. You know, the everything is the same the only thing that changes is the terminology you know and these guys just keep reinventing the wheel trying to put their spin on it but at the end of the day it's the same job you know and i, I think that's the biggest misunderstood problem uh, that law enforcement stoppers have and i said earlier you know uh, 
I wouldn't classify them as snipers, more of a marksman, but the potential's there. Uh, you know, that's on the commander. Uh, I think a lot of these guys on the law enforcement side are underutilized by their commanders. Uh, that's probably going to ruffle some feathers. Uh, what do you say that? What, what do you think that would ruff, ruffle feathers? Uh, you know, Rich, we, uh, if there's a problem, the only way to fix it is to identify the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you right now, uh, I'm a former law enforcement officer. My buddies are former and current law enforcement officers. I love them to death. And uh, hopefully you can help me out with this. But as far as law enforcement is concerned, we are our own worst enemy. Yes. And you know why? Because of egos. Egos, 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 man. And it's, it's, it's toxic. And it's killing the law enforcement community. That's why recruitment's down. That's why the perception is down. I mean... If, if you're crapping on your guys all the time and their morale sucks, obviously they're not going to answer calls satisfactorily to citizens. You know, if you're worried about getting clapped by your command staff, how are you going to go out here and do a good job solving somebody's problems, right? And then when you don't solve somebody's problems correctly, they're like, man, why did I even call the cops? You know, and, but I, anyway, that whole mindset, if we can just get rid of it, you know, and just get, get rid of the egos and be like, hey, let's learn. Let's seriously. I shouldn't worry about my own agenda, being promoted, being a deputy chief, being a chief of police, being the end all be all of whatever it is I'm going to be. If we can all just show up and have that mindset of being a lifelong student, man, it would go such a long way for the stocking community. And, uh, you know, I. I think it, it kind of goes back to our personalities. You know, uh, everybody likes to say, you know, oh, we're this alpha male, but, you know, alpha is that's what we are. I, I guess there is some truth to that. Uh, you know, it's just and I, I've been there, too, man. You know, uh, my first day on the jujitsu mats, I'm coming in and in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. You know, like I have to put a white belt on. Yeah. And then I put a white belt on and then I get destroyed. And I'm like, what? I don't understand. I thought it was already a black belt, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, I get it, man. I get it. It's hard to swallow that pride pill, but you know, you're not going to improve anything if you don't. And I know that there's good dudes out there in the law enforcement cyber community. Uh, I just, I don't know, man. I, I'm kind of all over the place. I'm sorry. I just, uh, <laughs> I just think if commanders could just maybe utilize their guys more there, then you could truthfully say there is a law enforcement sniper community, not a law enforcement marksman community, if that makes sense. And, you know, and the commander thing, that's, that's a military issue too. I mean, since the beginning of sniping, you know, you've had the snipers arguing with command staff on, Hey, utilize me the right way. I mean, it's just one of those never ending stories, you know? So. No, that that's a, that's a fact. And uh, I could go down that rabbit hole all day, but I want to touch on something you said regarding ego, because I got an email a day or two ago from uh, an AWS member who's a former Marine, current law enforcement officer. And he's like, man, Rich, I just need to vent something. I had this happen recently. I was coming off. Uh, it was, we're close to shift change and the call comes out as I'm driving the car back to the, to do roll call and shift change and it's burglary in progress. So I'm like a block away. I swing in there. I handle the call. And, uh, the, the guy that I'm relieving is really upset with me. He's like, dude, that was my call. And he's like, it's a robber. I can't remember if it's a robbery in progress or burglary in progress, whatever. He's like, so I'm supposed to drive all the way back 10 minutes to get there change over the car to you, let you get in the car and then come out when I'm a block away. He's like, well, I wanted that call. Is that my car? Is that your freaking car, man? That car belongs to the city. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times we, we, uh, I agree with you, man. We got to set that ego aside. As far as command relationships, I, I may write a book. I mean, we eat our own in the law enforcement community or we did when I was a cop. I didn't worry about the citizens. I loved them. I didn't worry about the bad guys. They're out there doing their thing. It's my job to stop it. I love that. 
but the person that I feared the most in my community was the command that I worked for. And I didn't feel that way in the Marine Corps, but I definitely 100% felt that way. And I worked for two different agencies, one county sheriff's department and one city police department. And I was terrified of both of them because I watched them just smoke guys and destroy them. And I, I didn't want to be a part of it, bro. I mean, it, it happens, you know, um, and it, it's a shame, um, Man, I, I'm just like you, you know, there's a rabbit hole you could go down with this stuff. And, uh, you know, I I know this is a live show and uh, I, I just want to tell the truth, man. You know, <laughs> uh, so an example of the issue in the law enforcement stopping community, I have a Word document saved on my desktop <laughs> and uh, just in case ever somebody ever called me to the plate on this, but uh, there was a time when I was so interested in being an instructor on the law enforcement side for sniping. uh, You know, I submitted my coursework to the American Sniper Association uh, because I read up on these guys and they're like a law enforcement committee, right? And uh, I, it sounded like they have a great program, man. I mean, because I read about them, they want everybody to, they're trying to get everybody together on the same page to kind of make a national standard, which I agree with, you know, if, if there could be a national law enforcement standard that would for sniping, that would be awesome, man. Uh, I mean, it would standardize training. It would set qualifications and make those easier. I mean, it'd be great because right now uh, so many different agencies do their own thing in house, you know, it's kind of hard to, if something happens and there's a multi-agency event, you know, communication is, is rough there's training gaps right yeah but uh so anyway these guys are trying to encourage from what i read about them they're trying to encourage like a national law enforcement sniping standard and uh they were like hey if you send us if you're an instructor if you're an organization you know send us your classwork and uh if we vet your course uh we'll put you on our website as a vetted course you know, we'll uh, show up, we'll register your students. All the, I mean, it sounded, you know, awesome. And uh, I understand how law enforcement works. I wanted all my coursework to be vetted. I want it to be legitimized because I wanted guys that showed up to my courses to get credit hours or something, you know, towards in-service, towards whatever. And, and plus, I mean, I don't want to be teaching dudes uh, how to snop and then somebody go and pull the trigger on somebody. And then I don't have my paperwork. Yeah. You know, in order for because I'm going to get called to court as an instructor, you know, 100 percent. And so anyway, so I contact these guys. Right. And uh, I I sent them an email and I, I talked to one of the guys. I forgot what his name was, but I told him what I was interested in doing. And he's like, OK, we'll send me your coursework. I gave him everything I had. I gave him my quals, uh, the reasoning behind I had my qual set up, all my PowerPoints, everything I gave this guy. I mean, I had to email. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I couldn't email all the stuff to him. I had to mail him a thumb drive. There was so much material I had because uh, I'm bad with technology. I couldn't like do the iCloud stuff or drop. Or anything. So I had to literally mail this guy a, a thumb drive of all this stuff because it was too big to email. And uh, like two weeks later, uh, they sent me a scathing report back. I mean, and these guys dogged me up the freaking road, man. I mean, uh, I was taken back. Uh, I, I actually vented to my wife about it. Uh, I I was speechless, man. I, I didn't know what to think or say. I mean, they basically told me, uh, you know, I, that uh, my stuff was articulated horribly. I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, you know, this isn't the Marine Corps. Don't bring that stuff here. There's no application for military tactics. Uh, this wow. is, I mean, and I have the document they sent me, you know, cause I was like, man, like it was so bad. I was like, I probably need to save this in case. So, <laughs> but, uh, and it was, dude, I'm not kidding, Rich. It was a two page word document of them just dogging me, bro. And I was like, man, what did I do to these guys? And I even emailed the guy back and I was like, sir, uh, you know, there's obviously, a lot I need to learn still. So thanks for your help. And I, I, I basically gave up the ghost of that organization. I was like, there's, so 
I went with my heart and my gut and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do what I feel like is right. And that's what I did. You know, if they want to pat me on the back and support me, fine. If not, that's fine too, you know, because I'm going to do what I feel like is right. But so I went and taught what I wanted to teach anyway, because in my opinion, that was the issue, you know, and going back to egos, that's all it was, man. I, I was looking up these guys bios and I'm like, why is everybody so close minded? You know, like I, I don't know. I, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent talking about all that, but I just an example of uh, how we eat our own, man. You know, I mean. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I could look like, again, I could give uh chapter and verse on the same sort of problems throughout and uh, uh we would have a five hour show this morning <laughs> i want to i want to shift gears man because i know that uh you and uh the rest of our brethren are watching what's going on in afghanistan pretty closely what did you think uh you know the handling of that uh the events in afghanistan so i i, I kind of already mentioned it earlier uh you know about the second cold war uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about this, but what? So I'm going to kind of come at this from a different angle. What what is our government kind of pushing everybody towards electric vehicles, right? Like there's a big push to get away from gas, diesel, all that and go with electric vehicles. So what people don't realize is what do you need for electric vehicles? Batteries. What mineral is there are all kinds of in Afghanistan, lithium. What does lithium go into? Batteries, right? Who's helping the Taliban? China. <laughs> I mean, because they uh, want to get the lithium and other minerals. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I just don't how I don't understand how people don't see that China is playing the chess game to win the economic war that they're what that they're basically waging on the world right now. You know, I mean it. Yeah, the long-term implications of, of Afghanistan, I don't think any of us can fully fathom right now, but but there are many. The long-term implications to our allies, the long-term implications to our enemies uh, are, are, are going to be studied in the years to come. You know, our grandkids will be reading about this debacle. Well, I mean, so th this is something else to think of. And, I, you know, I'm not one of those uh, doomsday kind of guys, but... Uh, you know, if you think about prior to 9-11, we didn't really have a foothold in Afghanistan. 9-11 happens. We go to war. OIF, OEF. Did we have any other 9-11 incidents between, you know, 9-11 and today? No, we didn't. And then now we're out of Afghanistan, just like we were pre-9-11. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I would bet my paycheck that there's going to be another uh, high-end terrorist event in America, unfortunately, because of this. Oh, well, I don't think there's any question in that. I mean, we have we have no presence in the region. None of the countries that surround Afghanistan are going to let us fly so much as a drone out of there. So we're going to have to go back in with a, a large footprint again. And we could have done something like Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. We'll, we'll keep Bagram. We'll make a 20 mile exclusion zone around it and uh, we'll we'll maintain a presence there for the foreseeable future, which means indefinitely. Well, we did not, we didn't do that. Well, and, and this is what I'm kind of confused on too. Where are other nations and governments going to draw the line with the Taliban? Because right now they're kind of being recognized as their own government. So that brings the question, okay, are they going to have access to the UN? Like, are they going to be represented in the UN? Like who's, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, they're a substantial military now, thanks to us. And they're the only, I won't say legitimate, but they're the only government in town in Afghanistan. And they have a military to, to you know, enforce their own sovereignty. So, Well, what most people don't realize, and I can break this down in a law enforcement analogy, too. So I think uh, I think a lot of dudes get confused on ISIL, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban. So don't think of it like that. Think of it like the Bloods. So you have in a gang organization, like think of the Bloods and then all the subset groups in the Bloods. You've got like Treetop Piru, Vice Lords, all that, right? But they're all Bloods. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. It's the same thing with all these terrorist organizations. You have the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIL, ISIS, ISIS-K. They're all Islamic extremists. They're just different sections depend with different leadership. But it's it's all the same face. It's all the same goal, if that makes sense. But I, I think people get wrapped around uh, the axle on understanding the difference. It's, it's the same thing, you know. I agree with you. Uh, Gerald asked a great question. He says, what's your favorite book? It may be unrelated to today's topic, but do you have a favorite book? Uh, Besides you know, the Bible. Besides yeah. the Bible. Let me get that out of the way. Uh, books are kind of like movies, man. You know, they kind of change uh, with time. I mean, you don't, I don't know what I don't know. Uh, right now, the book I'm reading right now just happens to be my favorite book, but you know, it might, my answer to that might be uh, changed in a couple months, depending on what I find or discover. So, but right now, my favorite book is uh, Winning Insurgent War. I think the guy's name is uh, gosh, Jeff uh, Dumoff is the author, I believe. I'm not I'm not 100% sure on the author's name. but uh, Let me ask you this, man. Where is all this lawlessness going? I'll ask you that, Zach. Uh, you know, I kept you on here about an hour and 40 minutes so far. But where's all this lawlessness going and what can a reasonable person do to protect themselves and their families? So uh, I'm not trying to get on here and be a preacher. You know, uh, you know, if you want to know where the world's going, uh, you know, you need to pick up the Bible. That's my opinion. Uh, everything's falling into place. But as far as the lawlessness goes, I mean, you know, we we still have a duty as a uh, as good men to do what we can to fight it, you know, uh, to fight evil. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how to, I don't have any answers for solving all the issues in the world, but I, I will tell you this, as far as what a reasonable, responsible armed citizen can do. Uh, I think the best thing you can do is put your family first and mind your business. As far as when it comes to self-defense, I, I think a lot of, People, just because you can carry doesn't mean you need to interject. Uh, you know, when it comes to self-defense, it needs to be self-defense. It's reactive. It's not proactive. Uh, that's my opinion on what somebody should do, I guess. Now, sounds good. Tony says, what is Zach's opinion on political uh, prosecutors? Uh, pertaining like political, prosecution. yeah, like uh, I mean, we saw it in Baltimore with the the Freddie Gray case where you had these uh, oh, I got district you. attorneys that are really politicized and they're yeah, uh, like can he specify his question? Like, what, what does he want me to? Well, right, right now, I would I will speak to the Tony's question briefly in that you have district attorneys right now that aren't following the letter of the law. If they were people like, uh, you know, officer Rolf down in Atlanta would not be being prosecuted for, uh, that shooting that he was forced to make. So um, I, mean, I think we see this again and again and again, where they're not following the letter of the law. They're, they're doing it as a, as a political a way to get, uh, you know, ele reelected, I guess. Uh, so, what should be done with them? They shouldn't be allowed to hold that office. I mean, in my opinion, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier, people like that are giving criminals impunity. That's where they're getting impunity from, you know, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier. If you grant a certain uh, section, a certain group, a certain, uh, I guess, type of population, a impunity, I mean, that's how revolutions start. That's how crime grows. That's how insurgency starts. Uh, I mean, it, it goes back to the judiciary system, you know, and, I, and that's why I feel bad for cops nowadays. Uh, you know, the issue isn't law enforcement. The issue is the judiciary branch. Cops have always been good at executing the laws, enforcing the laws. That's not the issue. The enforcement has never been the problem. It's always the prosecution, you know, and I, I saw it locally. You know, there's people are trying to get they're always trying to get promoted. They're always trying to, you know, make themselves look good. I got I got to have a good resume, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a lot of backdoor deals get cut, you know, from defense attorneys, prosecutors. And that, that's part of the problem of the revolving door in the court system, in my opinion. Uh, 
And it's even worse when it's politicized, you know, um, because then the goal is they're going to go uh, whatever with whatever uh, direction the culture is going. And right now the culture is going towards, hey, let's attack law enforcement. So these political people, like even if they don't believe in what they're spewing, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I want to be. Uh, hey, I, I don't want to be left behind. I, I, I want to get promoted. I want to have a good career. So, hey, let me jump on this bandwagon. Yeah, I hate cops, too. Let's go get them. Hey. You uh, let's go prosecute officer so and so for excessive force. Let's go, let's go after an indictment for officer so and so for premeditated murder because he shot the guy with a gun as he was giving verbal commands to drop it. You know, I mean, it's it's a shame. You know, I, I don't know the solution for it. Um, it goes back to leadership, man. I mean, we we've got to have leadership stand up and say no to this. Uh, leadership at a uh, chief of police level, leadership at a mayor level. I mean, I, I feel like we've kind of weakened ourselves as a society, uh, not being the men and women we should be. I mean, you can't appease everybody. And I, I think that's what the problem is now. We're so quick to jump to the easiest solution to not get backlash from people. What can make everybody happy? You can't make everybody happy ever. If you think that that's possible and it's going to bother you to upset people, you shouldn't be in a leadership position. I mean, that's just the, the truth, you know, and because you have to make decisions not only for you, but for the good of the organization that you're ahead of, the squad that you're in charge of, the community you're in control of. I mean, you have to you have to think long term, you know, and I, I think these leaders that we have is where all the problem is, because there's a horrible push right now from the media and uh you know from the ideological left to attack law enforcement and it's you need leaders to say hey that's not true you know we're we're not going to bow down to your wills and your whims because i'm going to get attacked in the media bring it on you know you want to lie about me i have nothing to hide you know open up the closet i don't have skeletons and if i do i'll tell you about them up front you know come on let's do this because my officer, like, you know, if somebody gets in a shooting and it was justified, hey, my officer, he was justified in his actions because of X, Y, and Z. If you don't like that, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. It's he followed the law. He followed policy. Hey, and you know what? And I'm not going to settle on a civil claim either. So you can sue the pants off the agents. I mean, th this is just me speaking if I was in a leadership role, you know. But yeah, of course. Hey, you know, hey, come after me. You want to you want to sue my agency? Go ahead. We're going to fight you for it. We're not going to bend over and give you a million dollars or whatever so you can go and contribute that back into the crime that your family's already committing. You know, uh, you were in the wrong. Your family member was in the wrong. I'm sorry. You know, we didn't personally wake up that day and decide, hey, this is who we're going to target. Just the circumstances of what unfolded, you know, whoever the suspect was, his decisions led to X, Y, and Z reaction of law enforcement. And this is my officer. I support his actions, you know, yada, yada, but it, I'm sorry, man. I'm not trying to go off on a tangent, but uh, I feel like I'm kind of rambling your head off. I just, uh, I just think if leadership would just put their foot down and say, Hey, uh, you want to be political about this? That's biased. You can't be biased. You've got to be impartial. If you're going to practice law, if you're not impartial, there's the door. Yeah, and you know, there was a shooting recently, I think it was in April uh, in Knoxville at Austin East High School. That that shows a lot of this. And um, I mean, what a debacle. I'm and, friends with all those officers involved, too. Yeah, and uh, it, what blows my mind is I think that the, uh, I'm not saying the attorney general, but um, she did a great job handling the officer involved shooting, showing the multiple camera angles, showing that the student clearly had a gun in his hoodie. Uh, he fired around, you know, into a trash can as he was trying to draw his gun. I mean, it, it was as clean, in my opinion, as a probably a shooting can be. It's tragic that a young man lost his life, but he lost his life because of his own criminal act conduct that day, which was a lot, by the way. And the community still rioted community still called for people's head. And I'm like, guys, uh, you know, I think that every community has to really be reasonable and objective. Like I get it. You didn't, you didn't want that young man to get killed, 
but that young man created those set of circumstances and he paid the ultimate price. Uh, but uh, anyway, that, that to me was just another example of what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got, you got to look back at who's leading uh, these riots, who's calling for these rallies to happen. I mean, it, it's kind of goes back into, uh, you know, insurgencies and revolutions and stuff. I mean, and you know, that book I was telling you about, it actually mentions uh, some of the topics we've been talking about, but there has never historically, there has never been a, an instance where a society just spontaneously decided to revolutionize itself. Uh, there's always a leader. There's always somebody at the head so to speak. And I, you know, it's the same way with the, with, uh, these organizations that support, you know, rioting and standing in the streets and shutting all this stuff down. These people aren't just spontaneously fed up and deciding, Hey, I'm just going to show up and, you know, raise cane. They're being rallied by somebody. And usually those people are Marxists. They're communists. They're anti-American. And, you know, I'm not trying to, I love watching Star Wars with my kids, you know, and uh, one of the newest Star Wars movies, man, I love this line. But uh, and I was thinking about this as it pertains to law enforcement and the media. You know, if you if you turn on the TV and you're watching news, you know, it's like, oh, you know, law officer so and so did this officer so and so did this. Oh, you know, they're riding over this. They're, I mean, if you're a cop, you're, you're looking at the news and you're like, man, like I'm by myself, like never the world's against me, you know. Um, but going back to that Star Wars movie, so there's a it, it was one of the newer ones. But, uh, you know, th that Poe Dameron guy or whatever is talking to this chick on the rooftop. And uh, I, that chick looked at him and she's like, that's how they win. They make you think you're all alone, mm. dude. And I was like, man, <laughs> I had an epiphany from a Star Wars movie, basically. But, man, that is so true, you know, and I, I think that's what's happening to law enforcement right now. Uh, it, you know, if we went out as officers and talked to the community as a whole, so many people support us. You know, so many people support law enforcement. So many people support the actions that officers make and the decisions they make. But you turn the TV on and the news portrays a story of uh, nobody's on your side if you're an officer. And I, and I think it's psychological warfare, man. You know, they want every individual officer to feel like it's them against the world. And yeah, that's it, and true. It, and it goes back to, you know, they're trying to shift impunity, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think, you know, I was talking to some of our, some of the guys that uh, we train with that are still law enforcement officers and, I said, so man, I couldn't imagine being a cop now. He says, I ah, really, the guys that, the people that hated us, they still hate us. You know, they hated us 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they still hate us. But the people that, that maybe were on the fence, a lot of those folks love us, you know, so they're, you know, we're getting a lot of love from the community and, and another side of the community, maybe that, that were before kind of quiet. Anyway, that was some of their opinion. Let me ask you this, Zach, and then we'll close this thing out. What can what can our viewers today do to make themselves harder to kill? Number one, and then I want you to talk through what is Zach's EDC, your everyday carry, uh, and maybe what your precision everyday carry would be. So, uh, the, your first question: uh, What can you do to be harder to kill? Mm -hmm. Be observant. That's what I would say. Uh, a lot of us just kind of zone in and out throughout the day. We we get up, we have our routines. Uh, we have our daily routines that we go through every day. Uh, everything kind of becomes mundane, you know. Uh, we just kind of zone out, go into autopilot. We always drive the same way to work. We always drive the same way home. Uh, you know, we always kiss our wife goodbye, walk out the door. You know, I mean we're just on this schedule and we're, we kind of become robotic before our mind goes into autopilot. Uh, so the reason I say, if you want to be harder to kill is be observant, start looking at everything. Don't just let your eyes zone out and go into autopilot, observe everything, process everything. Uh, what is, what are my neighbors doing? What is that car on the street doing? What is that guy on the sidewalk doing? Uh, 
you know, just observe, you know, if something makes your hair stand up, it's for a reason. We, we all have these uh, instincts, these senses as human beings. If something gives you the creeps, there's probably a reason it gives you the creeps. So be observant. Why does it give you the creeps? Think about it. Process it. Uh, I'm a big processing guy. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to be, uh, I want to process information. I want to make sure I'm making good decisions. Uh, I don't want to be an autopilot. I want to make sure I'm understanding and seeing the big picture, you know, because the devil is always in the details. But it, if you want to be hard to kill, pay attention. Pay attention to your surroundings. Pay attention to what environments you're putting yourself in, what positions you're putting yourself in, and et cetera. Uh, my everyday carry, I'm a minimalist. Uh, you know, my wife has a Glock 43, and uh, I have a 9 millimeter 1911. And 1911 because I love the way those fit in my hand, you know. Uh, I'm not one of these big prepper guys. If you are good for you, good on you. Uh, you know, I'm not knocking it. If you are just in my opinion, you know, uh, when I go out, I'm not going out to like, if I go with my family to eat, like we got to get back home, right? That's kind of like our base. So everything, that's why I'm a minimalist. Everything that I have is enough to just get us out of the situation. That's what self-defense is, you know, uh, I think the best analogy for this, and it, you know, it, a lot of people uh, without law enforcement military experience, they, they get these carry permits. Now in Tennessee, you don't even need a carry permit, but you, you know, they, they get a firearm carry permit, whatever. And uh, they're like, well, man, do I need to interject? It's like, no, you, you know, that's the biggest thing is understanding. You don't have to interject into everything just because you have a firearm. Uh, and I'm going to reference another movie, Enter the Dragon. Have you seen that? You talking about the old Bruce Lee movie? Yes, the old oh, Bruce yeah, Lee man. movie. So, you know, he's standing on that boat and that guy comes over, that American guy. And he's like, he's like punching at his face. Bruce, Bruce Lee is just like looking at him like, what are you doing? And then that guy's like, I know whatever martial art. He's like, what do you do? And he's like, the art of fighting without fighting. Yeah. And he's like, show it to me. And he's like, not here. How about that island? And he's like, okay. So the guy gets in the boat and he lowers him down in the water and he just lets the boat like kind of sail off to the side and he just walks away. And I'm like, Dude, but you know, and it's, it's funny, you know, cause that guy's like sitting in the water, shaking his fist at him, you know, ah, uh. <laughs> but you know, there's so many truths behind that. Uh, yes. You don't have to fight. Not everything re involves or requires a person to fight, you know, especially self-defense. Uh, your goal is self-defense is just survive. And relocate you know uh if i'm trying to defend myself and my family i'm not going to go to war with somebody i mean I, and i don't need the equipment to go to war if i'm trying to defend myself i just need to get back to my base which is my house right so uh you know my wife has a firearm i have a firearm your handguns it's enough to get whoever or whatever is going on around me off and get enough distance and time to where we can go back go back home, you know? And I mean, that's, that's really my EDC. I mean, it, it changes, uh, you know, if I'm going to go camping, so, um, sorry, I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but you know, if I'm out shopping, you know, I got my firearm, my wife's got hers, something happens, we get in the car, we come back home. If something happens directly to us, we eliminate the threat. We come back home, right? Uh, I don't need flashlights and compasses and, MREs and backpacks. I don't need all that stuff to just come back home. You know what I'm saying? Now, if I'm going on a camping trip, you know, hey, what's worst case scenario that can happen on a camping trip? Maybe somebody get injured. Maybe I get attacked by an animal. Maybe there is a self-defense situation involving another human in the woods, right? So on top of my gun, if it's allowed at the park or wherever you're at, on top of having a compass, having a map, having a protractor, having a flashlight, you know, that might change, but it just, it just depends on where you're going and what you're doing for the day, you know, but I, I'm a big minimalist. And as far as a long range rifle, what do you, what are you running right now? Uh, so self-defense Armageddon wise. Yeah. I, uh, zombies attack. Finally. Yeah, yeah. Zombies <laughs> attack. I have a 223 wild. Uh, it's awesome. It can chamber. It's a, it's a Daniel defense base AR. And I, I put 
my buddy helped me uh, put it together for me. He uh, he put a proof research carbon fiber barrel on it, 20 inch. Uh, you know, it can it can do depending on the ammunition that you push through it. It can do some damage. But I'll, the reason I have everything set up the way I have is because if something does happen as far as, uh, you know, God forbid something horrible as far as like, ah, man, you know, like a Red Dawn thing or maybe a martial law or whatever, uh, you know, if I was to ask you, hey, what do you think the number one ammunition choice would be in America? What would you say? Me? A rifle. Yeah. 556. Five, exactly. Right. Yeah. And if not 556, five, 223. Two, so yeah. I have the Daniel Defense Wild because it can chamber 223 two, and 556 five, without having to worry about blowing the barrel out. Right. It can chamber yeah. both cartridges. So I, that's my setup for that. Uh, you know, if I want to, if it's like home defense, uh, block defense, whatever you want to call it, close range, uh, I can put in some green tip, you know, and be good. If I need to make precision out of it, uh, I can take 77 grain IMI, that Israeli military industries, or uh, the 77 grain Black Hills. Black Hills is a good ammunition company too, but I can put that 77 grain in. And I mean, it's a, it's easily a minute and a half gun, you know, and it can, you got to be perfect with the wind because uh, the five, five, six or the two, two, three, you got to be perfect with your wind call on it. Uh, but I mean, it's within four rounds, you can easily hit a point target at a grand with that. I've already personally done it. So wow, that's, that's what I play around with. That's my Armageddon gun into the world. You know, well, I tell you what, Zach, that's probably a good good place to end it, man. It's been two hours and one minute. An amazing show, brother. I appreciate you finally getting you on the show. I know. I'm sorry, man. I, I didn't mean to talk your head off. I feel like I didn't even get to talk about some of the things I wanted to talk about. Well, we can always do round two, man. I'd love it. Okay. So listen, guys, thank you for uh, – thanks to Zach for coming on the show today. Thanks for everybody that watched us live. Thanks for everybody that's going to watch on the Coffee with the Rich YouTube channel. Thanks for everybody that will listen uh, on podcast to come. We really appreciate you being with us uh, here on Coffee with Rich, Zach. Thanks, man. And remember, Thanks. folks, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>